Grace and peace, everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. I'm Chris Bailey, and we really appreciate you spending just a few moments of your day that I hope will make an eternal difference in your faith. We're talking about Jesus as the perfect sacrifice in this series through the lens of the book of Hebrews. And as we start the journey, we want to begin by focusing on this uh, idea of sacrifice, not the brutality, but the beauty of it, the purpose of it to understand the great sacrifice in Christ Jesus. You know, before we get going, I want to remind you that if you're appreciating the video, praise the Lord, like, share, and subscribe to the channel so that we can stay in touch. And then we want to remind you too, to check us out online at changeministry.org. There you're going to find a whole lot more than you're going to find in this single video. And if you want to support the ministry, we appreciate that. And you can give by donating at changeministry.org slash donate, or just click the button below. And now as we begin the study, Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we invite your presence into this space and ask that you would help us to understand your love through the giving of your son to us. We pray. Amen. As we look at Jesus as the perfect sacrifice, let's give some definition and some meaning because we sometimes can assume that we understand this New Testament or this new covenant of sacrifice and assume that everybody owns the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, that the practical sacrifices were actually lessons, little, little Bible lessons to help us to be ready for when Jesus comes and now to help us to be ready to believe since Jesus has come. When you look at those in the Old Testament, they teach us that there are different kinds of sacrifices, but there's only one kind of Savior, Jesus. It's a picture or a portrait of Jesus in every aspect of the five major sacrifices that we see listed here in the book of Leviticus. So let's jump from Hebrews over to Leviticus. We start here in chapter one to see this particular sacrifice. Leviticus chapter one, verses two to three says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Here we have the first sacrifice illustrated here in a book that a lot of times we just like to skip through. Or we just look over altogether. But there's Jesus in the book of Leviticus. And this sacrifice was known as the burnt offering. The burnt offering because you notice how I'm saying offering, not just sacrifice. This is actually a way for us to communicate to the Lord our love for him and for us to show our recognition of our need for him. And when this offering was given on the altar, it was burned completely. So what does that illustrate as far as Christ is concerned? He's 100. He gives all whenever he gives up himself to us. He gives in terms of sometimes we think of the, the exponentiality of what God gives. And if he just gives a lot, then, then that's a blessing. But if it's a little bit, you say, oh, thank you, but it's no big deal. But what I hope we see in this offering is the allness of God. And that is that he is totally focused on us. Our father is looking at his children both night and day. We sleep because we get tired. But our father, our heavenly father never sleeps because he never gets tired of thinking about us. Think about that. This complete sacrifice in the burnt offering. Let's go to the next one. It's in Leviticus chapter two. In chapter two, Leviticus verses one and two, it says, and when they or when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take there out his handful of the flour thereof and of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. An offering, burning frankincense within this flower. So what is the flower? The flower is simply a grain, right? And remember, not all flour is just wheat, but praise the Lord, we can get flour and the flour I prefer and the flour we use is oat flour. Taking oats and doing what? Crushing them, polarizing them until they're flour. And then that flour would have this frankincense, this, this smell good on that. And as it's burnt, this sweet savor would, would rise, not just from the altar in the presence of the people, the priests, but it would be a sweet savor to the Lord. 
because this illustrates our faith in the broken bread, the broken body. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And that bread of life feeds us, but it's the brokenness of Christ. It's the sacrifice of Christ that does not just feed us temporally, but allows us to live and feeds us eternally. He was broken. Isaiah said he was bruised for our transgression and to understand to what degree he was crushed. Isaiah said there was no form of comeliness in him. And he goes on to say how when they saw him, he wasn't even recognizable on the cross because in a very real way, the bread of life was broken so that I can be whole, so that we can be one, so that we can have a future. He was crushed like flour. But the third one, the third one here is in Leviticus chapter three. This is amazing. In Leviticus chapter three, this sacrifice, it says, if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering. If he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. This offering in Leviticus 3 is the peace offering. And I hope we're seeing that the offerings were not always in this, this approach to penitence, or, or, but it was actually also, these were a way to express praise. And this peace offering was an offering that, that would be had or, or given to, to celebrate a peaceful journey or a peaceful resolution to some conflict, or ultimately the peace that we receive through faith in the sacrifice to come at the time of Leviticus. So this peace offering was showing us what? We have and we can receive the Prince of Peace. Jesus is illustrated. This sacrifice is a symbol of the peace that Christ brings back to us who have no peace. Psalm says the wicked have no peace. And Solomon says that they cannot experience peace because they are out of line, out of will. They're even against the God of grace. But now with this peace offering, we can be at peace. We can sleep like a baby at night. I actually had a sleep like that this past week where I slept through the whole night. There was something different when I woke up that morning from when I went to sleep at night, but woke up in day. The peace offering is an illustration of that experience for those who believe in the great sacrifice. A couple of more. One more in Leviticus, rather, next to last one in Leviticus chapter four, verse 13. It says, and if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance, and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty. When the sin which they have sinned against it is known, then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation. Bring him before the people because Jesus will be brought before the people. And even though they would refuse him and reject him and even choose Barabbas, this is the offering. When we think of sacrifice that we normally think of, that is the sin offering. This is that substitute. This is one standing in the gap for us because we have created a gap through our sin or through our violation of the will of the law of God. But notice this, this, this young creature Jesus, around 33 years old, a young man willing to give up his life so that we could live. That's what's illustrated here in the burnt offering and the sacrifice for sin. As we're going to see in this series, there's only one way out of sin. And the Bible says that's through the shedding of blood because the wage or the consequence of that sin is death. And thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Father, for the illustration of this offering to show us Jesus is that sacrifice for our sins. One more, one more in chapter five. Leviticus chapter five, 15 says, if a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass into the Lord a ram without blemish of, out of the flocks. With thy estimation of sh by shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering, and he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing and shall add the fifth part thereto and give it unto the priest and the priest shall make an atonement for him with the ram for the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. This is an offering of reconciliation. 
But on the one hand, we receive the atonement through that burnt offering. This trespass offering or this reconciliation offering or sacrifice is all about the healing that happens after at one minute. It's all about the relationship that is to grow into and to become after things have been made right. This is our hope. And that is that Jesus wants to make amends with us, but he also wants us to experience this making amends with our brothers and sisters. That's the fiber and that's the, the power of the church. It's not that it's a group of people who don't do anything wrong. It's a group of people who are constantly learning how to forgive. And it's in that space of, of granting forgiveness that we actually let us and we allow and empower all of us to grow in our faith. I've learned it after 22 years of marriage. Marriage is not a union of two perfect people. It's a union of two imperfect people who learn how to perfectly forgive. That's the only way, not just to, to, to stay together, but more importantly, to be together. In this little illustration of our relationship here on earth, I hope that that's what we're going to see in our walk with the Lord. This oneness and these offerings, praise the Lord, we don't have to offer them literally, but still to this day, spiritually, the principles are not just a promise, but they're also the path that we can have in our relationship with God and with one another. I hope this has helped and encouraged us. If it has, please like the video and pass it on and share it with somebody else. But above all, by the grace of God, let's make sure we believe it.